Hi, welcome to Naptime Nutrition. I'm Yafi Lavova, registered dietitian nutritionist and owner of Baby Bloom Nutrition and Toddler Test Kitchen. And today we are tackling a really big subject and I wanted to bring on special guest, Rachel Tuffman, um, LMHC. Uh, she's a therapist focusing on kids and teens and women and, and specifically body image. And today we're talking about when your child thinks that they're fat. So thank you so much for joining me, Rachel. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah. Well, this has been brought up a lot, and I did um, I, I did a segment on putting your child on a diet. And spoiler alert, that's not something we recommend at all. Um, but I did a segment on that. That's from the parent's perspective, when the parent is concerned about the child's weight and how to understand the child's weight and normal growth patterns and what to do about it and what not to do about it. So this time we're taking a different angle. It's when the child brings it up and the child says, I'm getting fat or I want to go on a diet. And this question comes up a lot and and the viewers and listeners may be surprised at how early that really starts. So thank you for joining me for this. Uh, let's just get started with what healthy really means. I think that's the, the best place to start. Yeah, okay. So I think that um, we have to define what health is. And I think a lot of the time when we think of being healthy, automatically people kind of move to exercise and diet, right? So do you go to the gym and what do you eat? Like, do you eat fruits and vegetables, salad, drink a lot of water? And I think that health is, is that is definitely a part of health, right? Our exercise, our movement behavior and how much we engage in movement and, you know, exercise and definitely what we eat that does contribute to our health. But health is a lot more than that. Health is also about our psychological and emotional well-being, our spiritual well-being, our financial well-being, our relationships, our sleep patterns, our connection and community, our happiness at our jobs, um, whether or not you're in a safe environment where you live, if your community, if your home is safe, all those kinds of things, those also, you know, your race, that contributes to your health. So there's so much that that is um, a contributing factor to our to our health that it's not just one or two things and you can be eating healthy and exercising and still have really poor health outcomes so i think that when we give so much um, emphasis and power to those two things we're really missing the mark and sometimes we know that when you become so obsessed with those health behaviors like eating and exercise sometimes that can become something very unhealthy right which we know there's this orthorexia which is this obsession with being healthy and that's really can counterproductive because all of the stress that you're putting on yourself to be this healthy person and make sure that you eat things that are organic and chemical free and whatever it is all of all of that stress and and worry that you're causing yourself is actually doing a lot more harm to your body so whatever goodness you're putting in there it's counteracted by all of the stress and anxiety that you're causing yourself so health is a lot more than just those two things it is all encompassing and there are so many things that influence it and that's important to remember you know? Right. Yeah. It's, and, and as a dietitian, I am a hundred percent on board with that statement that a lot of times we look to nutrition as the answer, whether it's the answer for um, depression or anxiety, or it's the answer for cancer or the answer for anything. And that puts a whole lot of pressure on our food. And when we put that much pressure on our food, to save us or to prevent certain disease states, either um, mental or physical, it, it's not it's not fair to our relationship with food and it's not beneficial to our relationship with food. What we wanna pass down to our kids is food enjoyment because food enjoyment leads to enjoyment of variety and variety is, it, it's all tied in together with a healthy relationship with food and, and, and having an interaction with food that's positive. And all of this all together does actually lead to better physical health outcomes down the line. But we do need to take in all of the factors that were mentioned. Yeah, definitely. And I actually like that point about, um, you know, when we rely, there's this whole idea of like food is medicine, right? And that's like a dangerous road to go down because yes, while food is very important for our health and yes, there are certain foods that we know have benefits to our health and, you know, and, and are better for cell production and, and keeping us, you know, like on our toes and keeping us feeling vibrant and alive. Like it's not medicine, you know, food again is just one tiny factor of how we 
take care of our bodies and how we care for our health. So again, it is very important. Nutrition does play a big role in the way we care for ourselves, but it's just one piece, you know, and focusing too much in one area, you know, we neglect other areas that are just as important. So I think that that's a really important point also. Yeah, so then the take home that we want you, the parent have to, to have with this is that, that, that nutrition is not health and health is not purely physical. We do need to look at all of these different factors. We need to look at the mental and the social, the emotional, the, the connection factors, as well as food, because the very things that you're trying to prevent with food, you might be causing with, with stress to follow a very strict regimen. And I also did a segment on that with another dietitian, Natara Fennig. We talked about when the pursuit of health goes too far. Um, and that is also another common issue that we have in families now. So, okay, so now that we've talked about that, um, that, that health is not just physical, the reason we wanted to talk about that is because health is not just physical and it's not found on the scale. Yeah. So the BMI, I mean, it's, I could do an entire segment on the history of the BMI, what it was intended for, what it was not intended for. It certainly wasn't intended for its current use. It was not intended as a health marker. It was, it was created by a mathematician in order to help with certain statistics, looking at certain statistics, not as a diagnosis or um, any real meaningful data at all, really. Um, people can be different sizes and be healthy. You can be bigger and be healthy. You can be smaller and not be healthy. And so it's important to have a wider view of health when we're talking to our kids about that as well, to really internalize that before coming to your kids with that, because you need to, to have that, that dynamic, that perspective when you're talking to kids to say, well, people do come in different shapes and sizes and that's okay. Yeah, I think also that um, we kind of get caught up in, you know, and, and I think this is perpetuated sometimes, unfortunately, by the medical community, when we bring our kids to the doctor, and then we look at those growth curves, and, and they're using BMI to measure our kids health, then when your doctor makes a comment like, oh, you know, he's getting big, or she's, she's kind of big for her age, then we start freaking out. Well, what does that mean? And because we believe this, you know, this line about, you know, size equals health and BMI is a measure of health, then sometimes that coupled with our doctor who we trust, we start thinking, oh no, like my kid must not right. be healthy, you know, and shoot, like, I mean, they seem fine and they play and they're happy and they sleep and they're with their friends and they have a great appetite and everything's great. But now my doctor's telling me that they're not healthy. And so that's where I say parents really need to trust their gut in these instances, in these circumstances, when you go to the doctor and let's say your child is in a little bit of a bigger body and then your doctor makes a comment, I would say you really have to advocate for your child and for yourself and say like, are we seeing anything in their blood work or are we seeing something that makes you feel that there's a concern that there there is some kind of underlying health issue that, that we can see from labs? And if not, you can't look at a person and determine their health. You just can't, it's not possible. And we know this because like you said, we can look at someone who's thin and there can be so many issues. And I've gotten so many messages from people that say like, you know, I'm very thin and people are always like, wow, you look great. And I have chronic illness. I have, you know, I'm, I have something more serious, you know, like a terminal illness, or I have depression and I can't eat, or I have a thyroid issue. And, you know, I just I, like, no matter what I do, I can't gain weight. So we never know what we're complimenting when we tell someone, oh, you look great, you lost weight, you're thin, wow, amazing. That doesn't necessarily mean that someone's in a healthy space. You know, it's also important that when we look at kids, um, you know, growth and development, there's a growth chart, right? So we want to make sure it's not linear kids growth, but like we really just look at trends when kids are growing. So if your kid has always kind of been a bigger kid, of course, they're going to be the 90th percentile or the 97th percentile, or they're just going to be in a bigger body because that's their makeup. That's who they are. So you really also have to kind of take a step back and tell your doctor, unless there's like a real medical concern that we've looked at something, that there's some kind of cholesterol or blood work that's giving you, you know, pause to say like, uh oh, we need to deal with something, then please like, don't say anything about my child's weight, you know? And I would say if, you know, do a blind way, right? So that your child doesn't face the scale and that you tell your doctor in advance, if you have any concerns about weight, please speak to me when the child is out of the room. And again, you also kind of have to be aware though of what your stories are and what your feelings are about hearing that maybe there is a concern about your child's weight and then what you're gonna do with that. 
So I think that's important also having that emotional preparation of, you know, what it means to be in the doctor's office and, and knowing that sometimes doctors can be wrong, you know, in their right. assessment of health for children. We live in a world of specialization. You go to a pediatrician for your kids, you go to a, an OB for, for women's health. You go, you go to every different doctor for different issues. And the thing is that you go, you go to a therapist for mental health and you go to a dietitian for nutrition health. And so that has positives and negatives, but the main thing that, that it's important to know is that we all know our own field. And there is some overlap between fields, but if you're looking for a question about food and weight and 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 that, you go to a dietitian. The pediatricians are not necessarily trained very well in that. They're trained in what they're trained in. They're trained in a lot of things, and it's important to not put undue pressure on each different specialty. You wouldn't go to a pediatrician with a problem about about an adult foot, for example. So it's important to keep to keep in mind who has what training and who can answer questions best. I do wish that a lot of pediatricians could explain the growth chart a little bit better. I think that there is understanding there. It's just more from what I've seen in the communication from doctor to parent. But I mean, personally, I've heard, oh, your child's at the 50th percentile. That's great. Well, you haven't seen them before. You don't know what their trends are. This is one data point. Perhaps they were at the 90th or the 20th last month, and it indicates an issue. So so it's important. I also actually did a segment on the growth chart and how to read the growth chart and how to understand it, because there's a lot of misconception out there. And also, as Rachel mentioned, it's okay to be different sizes. It's okay if your child was born at the 90th and continues to be at the 90th. That's an indicator of health. That's not an indicator of a problem. Yeah. So it's important to know that, and um, and the growth chart is important for the medical side of things to be able to have th this data to help identify any problems in growth or problems in development. But it's not really that problem that that it's not that really important from the parents' side to know this information and to try to interpret it on their own. So if you're having issues with that, it's best to get in contact with a pediatric dietitian who can help you interpret those numbers, and likely feel a little bit better about it. Yeah. And important to know also that if you go to the doctor and, and, you know, there is a conversation that causes you concern, the answer is not to then go home and say, okay, we're going to go on a diet. The doctor said, you know, things are looking, whatever. Um, for, for a few reasons, the, the most basic, I think the most important reason um, is diets cause harm in so many ways, right? So we know that the mental and physical damage that a diet does is far worse than if your child just stays in their bigger body, right? We, there's so much evidence, science, years and years of research. This isn't just research studies, like recent studies. This is 30 years of research that has shown there is inflammation. They end up at higher weights. Not to say being at a higher weight is necessarily bad, but if you're putting your child on a diet because you don't want them to be big, putting them on a diet ensures that they will probably land at a bigger size than they would have been had you just let them grow into their bodies. We know that 95% of diets fail. There's only 5% of people that are able to lose weight and keep it off. And even then, we don't even know what measures they're going to to keep it off, right? So if, if you're told that you have an illness and there's a medication that 95% chance that it won't work and it might do damage, but there's a 5% chance that it might help you. Are you going to take that medicine? Or are you going to be like, eh, no thanks doc. Like I'll figure out other ways to manage this. Why would we risk our health like that just for a 5% chance of something that might work and might not. And the measures that we might have to go while we're taking that medication to ensure its success. Like it's just not worth it. So for a child to be on a diet, you're just setting them up for a lifetime of yo-yo dieting which is worse for their health, possibly leading them into an eating disorder, which we know eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of all mental illnesses, or disordered eating, which I would say probably most of us have, right? Unless you know you grew up with a healthy relationship with food or you've healed it, most of us have disordered eating patterns, and that's because we live in a diet culture society. Um, and all sorts of other mental health issues, depression, anxiety, sometimes suicidal behavior, self-esteem issues. It's just, there's nothing good that comes out of a child being on a diet. And I see so many adults now who their first diet was at eight or nine years old and, <laughs> and they are 
traumatized forever. They remember like how they were told they couldn't eat certain things or their body was bad. And then they grow up continuing to feel that way, that it's just a lifetime of body shaming and, and a poor relationship with food. So we're not doing anything good by putting them on a diet. And I think we would be far better off um, by using, and we'll talk about this more, I guess, but using division of responsibility, right? With Ellen Satter, who she is, by the way, I don't, I'm pretty sure she's not haze aligned, like she's not health at every size aligned, but um, a lot of her concepts make sense for health at every size and for intuitive eating. Um, but she has this idea of division of responsibility where we, the parents, we're kind of in charge of what is put in front of our kids in terms of whatever we offer in the home. And then our kids get to choose. And this gives them that autonomy to listen to their bodies and to decide what feels good in their bodies. And we give them that trust of like, you know what, here's the variety, you take what you want from it. And when, you're, when you've had enough, great. And if you want some more, great too. But we just give them that like ability to see that they can trust themselves and that food is like a safe thing. So I think that's important also, like, instead of running and, and, and again, I get a lot of messages, oh, my doctor told me that my child is too big, like, can you give me a, a dietitian or a nutritionist to put them on a diet? I say, absolutely not. I can give you a dietitian, an RD, right? And I think we should probably differentiate that for people also. Um, I can give you a dietitian who will speak to you about how to create a healthy relationship with food and your child's body and help you to, to understand what health means for your child. But I will absolutely never, ever, ever refer a child to a dietitian or a nutritionist. Um, I will only work with a parent who wants to see a dietitian to help them learn how to feed their child properly without trying to restrict them or shrink them or change their body. So I think that's important also just knowing that, that if you hear that from a doctor, it's not jump to diet. Like there's so much more harm in that you know and that that's something that's that's generally accepted by the medical community is that we don't put children on diets but we still do have some of those holdouts people who learned that in medical school a while ago or people who um who really take their profession to heart and see that as the that's their worldview and they see health as that limited view that we started discussing that it's physical and they're not looking at the other perspective so it's important for you as the parent to be the advocate and to understand that um, and the, the the feeding dynamics that are popular now, mainly Ellen Satter's Division of Responsibility, um, we also have stuff from Jill Castle, it's pretty similar, it's just a responsive feeding, giving the child the autonomy, as you mentioned. Um, those start at the table when you start feeding solids, and I like to advocate for starting that concept at the breast, at the bottle, from the first day of life, by feeding on demand rather than following a strict schedule. As a child grows, you're going to, to move into a schedule naturally. And by the time they get to be um, six months, nine months, a year, you're starting to see more of a schedule formed. But when you start out by feeding on demand, you're telling your baby, you are experiencing hunger. That is a valid thing to feel. I want you to recognize that and to know how to meet your hunger. This is one of the very few things that babies are actually born knowing how to do. In the rest of the animal kingdom, they come out and they can walk right away. And our our kids are not like that, you know, for better or for worse. Um, but this is the one thing that they really do know how to do right out of the gate. So, so it's important from, from day one to help them understand that their hunger is important, that their biological signals of hunger and fullness, and then later satiety, which is more of an emotional connection to the satisfaction of having filled yourself. Um, it, it starts out that young and we do need to encourage them to honor those signals. And that comes up a lot in these segments that comes up with my kids not eating enough or my kids eating too much or it's all over the place and it always comes back to we as adults need to honor our biological signals we need to eat when we when we're hungry we need to stop when we're done whenever we decide that is and we need to get that through to our kids as well yeah and since rachel you brought up the difference between dietitian and nutritionist i am sure i've addressed this a lot but <laughs> it's always good to bring it up you're right it's always yes, good. I think we just need so, to keep saying it yeah, yeah, and you never know who's listening for the first time. So, um, I am a dietitian, which means I have a um, I have a bachelor's actually in nutrition. I have another bachelor's in comparative religions. That's a whole other lifetime. Um, and after that, 
um, starting in, in a couple of years, we're going to have to get a master's in nutrition or a related field in order to become a dietitian. As of right now, you can do it straight from a bachelor's, but um, you get into a very competitive residency-like program out of the degree. In my class, I was one of four people who actually got into it. It's extremely competitive. It's very intense, hands-on learning for six to nine months, depending on the program, and then passing a national exam. In some states, we also have state exams, like New York State and um, a lot of other states as well. And then you have to keep up a good amount of continuing education in five-year cycles. A nutritionist, uh, so that's the definition for dietitian. It is a solid definition, much like you have a definition for doctor or lawyer. Um, it's you, you get in trouble if you use it and you're not actually, you're not backed up by all of that education and experience. So a nutritionist, could be someone who read an article or could be someone who has a PhD in nutrition but didn't go the dietitian route. So it's very, very, very important that you ask direct questions if someone's calling themselves a nutritionist. Where did you study? What kind of program did you complete? Sometimes you are going to hear, I have a master's in nutrition from Arizona State University. Okay, great. Maybe this is someone who, who knows what they're talking about, then you have to talk about specialties and experience and all that. Um, but you just as well might hear, uh, well, I took a two week online course. Right. And that's not going to be someone who can say, oh, hey, you shouldn't have star fruit because you have a kidney issue and that could kill you. This That's the type of knowledge as dietitians, we learn about medicines and medical interaction with food and we learn specifics. And when you have a surface level nutritionist program, you're not going to get into certain things like why someone on an anticoagulant wants to watch their vitamins E and K and which foods off the top of our head might have vitamins E and K and then which medications might also interact with that. It's, right. it's, it's a depth of knowledge that doesn't often present itself, but it's important to know that it is there. Yes. Yeah. So important. Yeah. Okay. So let's get into the, to the real crux yes. of this. Um, how to respond to the child who comes to you and says, mommy, I'm fat or I want to go on a diet. Okay. Yes. So if you have a child that comes to you and says, mommy, I'm fat, let's start with that. It really depends, first of all, on the age of the child, right? We want to figure out like, what does that mean? Right? So instead of jumping to, oh my gosh, who said that? You're not fat. Right? Oh, that's, what does that mean? You're fat. Right? Try to figure out like, what, where did they hear that? What does that mean to them? Right? It could be something that's very neutral. And it's just like that, you know, they have fat on their body right? Which is an observation. We all have fat on our body. That's fine. If it's I'm um, fat and I think that's bad and I don't like myself and I want to go on a diet, then that's a separate conversation that then you need to have. And you need to figure out why they feel that way. Where is that coming from? And then explaining to them how the answer is not to go on a diet and hurt their bodies. The answer is instead to look at kind of why they why we believe that right who tells us that being fat is bad and then focusing on body respect and taking care of ourselves and kind of giving them the empowerment the tools the responses to talk back to whoever says that to them or to whatever that voice is in their head that's telling them you're fat and you need to change your body so we really want to validate right if it comes from you know kids at school said i'm fat or when i was in my bathing suit at camp somebody said, oh, you you are, you know, put on a t-shirt chubby or whatever it is. You want to validate that hurt that they felt embarrassed and ashamed, but you don't want to validate like, yeah, but you know, maybe you should wear a t-shirt at the pool then if the kids are going to make fun of you, right? We don't want to reinforce the message that there's something bad about their body. It needs to be hidden. They need to change it. You really want to give them the message of like, we live in a society that tries to tell us that we're all supposed to look and be a certain way. And that's just not true. And you are made exactly how you're supposed to be, right? Like however you look is how you're supposed to look. And you don't have to change that just because someone isn't comfortable with what you look like. So you wanna empower them and you wanna give them that confidence to believe that people are gonna say mean things, but it doesn't mean that it's true and you don't have to change yourself so that they'll leave you alone, right? Because at the end of the day, when we try to change ourselves to fit in better, literally, right? But also figuratively to fit in better to what people like about, want us to be, we end up hating ourselves, right? When we're trying to conform 
the only people that we hurt are ourselves. And, you know, so yes, yeah, someone else might feel happier with how we look. There's no guarantee, but we end up feeling bad about ourselves and it's never good enough. So you want to give that message of, yeah, you're going to hear those things from people and people are going to make comments about your body and you might internalize those comments, but you have to realize that that's not true. And that's, you don't have to change your body, right? There's so much more to you than how you look. Um, so I would say for an older child, if you see that that's where that comment is coming from, that it is coming from a place of being self-conscious and being insulted and seeing other kids and comparing themselves, then you definitely want to talk about that body respect and, and not trying to change. If it's a younger child, again, you just want to find out, like, maybe they're hearing diet talk. Again, maybe it's just like an observational thing. I'm, I'm so fat. Ha ha ha. We want the word fat to be neutral also. Right. So when they're little and they come and they say they're so fat, you don't want to say that's not nice. Don't say that. That's not a nice word. You know, and I actually was once at a talk where I heard someone um, saying that, that she she had her own issues with eating and food and she was trying to do better for her kids. And she said they were taking a walk and her daughter noticed like a bigger woman and said, oh, she's so fat. And she was like, oh, don't say that. Don't say that. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, yes, don't comment on people's bodies, but don't make her think that saying someone is so fat is a terrible thing. We want fat to be a neutral descriptor. Like that person is fat. That person is small. That person is tall. That person has brown hair. It's not a bad word. We really want to take away the, the pain and the insult of being fat. So yeah, everybody has fat on their body. Some have more and some have less. And people try to hurt your feelings when they say that, but we don't have to let them. We have to say, I understand that you're trying to make me feel bad about myself, but I'm not going to let you, you know? So I think empowering them and giving them tools to help themselves internally, not necessarily fight back or say anything to whoever's talking to them. Sometimes the answer is just to kind of not say anything and, and do the work internally. I think that's really important for our kids. Um, that, that I think is really what we wanna focus on. Yeah, I think it's great you brought up the, the observation because my my little guy is three and he, he just makes observations about his body and at um a lot of them are <laughs> a lot of them we have to stifle laughs you know because it's definitely a boy house over here but uh, <laughs> but when they're when they're that young a lot of times they're just like wow look how big my hand is look how big my ears are look how big my tummy is and it's just it's just noticing it's just them owning their body and saying hey look at me i'm a big boy and that's that's good because you want you want to make them feel important and built up. So it is important to look at what they're trying to say and not jump to our own um, jump to our own conclusions and create an issue where there might not be one. If you do find yourself jumping to that, it might be a good idea to touch base with a therapist on, on possibly your relationship with your body, your relationship with your food, because it's amazing how we think that we've handled certain issues and then parenting just brings, brings it. it all up again. I was yeah. on a thread yesterday about bullying and it wasn't about bullying with the kids. It was about our own histories of bullying. And we we think that we've dealt with things, but they come up with parenting and body image stuff will come up with parenting. Yeah. Um, and that's, it, it's good to feel confident for your own self with that. Yeah. 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 Very important. And, and yeah, and kids will say things all the time. Like I was even thinking just about my daughter saying recently, like commenting on like her, she's little, she's four. And she like, I think she was joking about it, but she was like, oh, my tushy is so big. Right. So I could have been, <laughs> oh, you know, but I was like, she's totally just talking, probably trying to be silly and saying she's big and whatever, or just for her on her little body, like when she has this cute little tushy, she might be saying that. So I was like, yes, and it's so perfect, right? Like done, not like, oh my gosh, well, maybe we should start doing some squats or don't say that or like, <laughs> let's just let it go. Like she's just observing and maybe in her eyes or even if kids say it to you, right? Sometimes kids will say to us, parent, mommy, your tummy is so big, your tushy is so big, right? And parents get all nervous. like. Oh my God, is she saying that I need to lose weight and I haven't been feeling so good and I just had a baby and, and my kid thinks I look disgusting. Like, remember that from their angle, everything is so big, right? Like, if you think about like the house that you grew up with in when you were a kid and you drive by it today, you're like, I remember that house felt so huge. But I was <laughs> like, 
their their view of the world is so distorted because they're so tiny. So just remember that also, like, yes, kids are very honest, but their point of view from the world is is very different from, you know, the adult point of view. So just remember that also, like kids can say things, your nose is big, your hair is weird. It doesn't necessarily mean that like, you know, you need to get, you should go and get a consult for rhinoplasty, ma, or like, you know, you should really lose some weight. Like kids just say things. And again, I think that we have to then ask ourselves, like, why is that so triggering for me? If my kid said like, mommy, your belly is big. Like it is what it is, you know? Right. Yeah, I've got some pretty significant spider veins that my kids have just started noticing. And I posted about that on Instagram, just what that felt like when they would point it out and say, what are those? Well, they look more like spiders. No, they look more like spider webs. And and I was just really trying to keep my cool because I just I just wanted to run away. And it's not because I'm self-conscious about it. It's just because like I don't like people talking about my body. But these are these are my kids. They're asking questions. And then um, two weeks later, one of them sitting in the pool yesterday is looking at his legs, trying to find his spider veins. <laughs> right. He's six. He doesn't have spider veins. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's also important, um, and you brought up, I just want to bring it up again, that they could be repeating something that they've heard. A lot of times, even if we think that we're in a healthy place or or we're trying to to overcome something on our own, um, a lot of a lot of parents are still weighing themselves and are still dieting, and they they are also conscious to not pass that on to their kids. And that's that's wonderful to be conscious to not pass that on. Um, kids have amazing hearing, you know. Unless you're asking them to say please or thank you, they can hear you very well. And if if they see that you're disappointed with the number on the scale, they will they will hear that very loudly. Yeah. Um, and you don't need words to hear that either. Um, if you get on the scale and start crying in front of your child, they are going to take a message from that. And it's not the message that you want to send. Because if if you are upset by what's on the scale, then you know how much that hurts and how, how deeply that feels. And you don't want that for your child when they're in your position. Yeah. And that's that's why we're talking about this because we do want to set our kids up for success and that means confidence and that means not scale obsession. Um, so it's very important to not talk about your own body in a disparaging way or to make comments about other people, even compliments. Oh, you look so great. You must have lost some weight. When your child hears that, they hear losing weight is good. And that's certainly not a blanket statement that's accurate. Yeah. That's not what we want them to hear. Yeah. And that's that's important also bringing up that point. Like they hear, they're watching and they're listening. So if you are having a conversation with a friend and you're saying, oh, I need to lose weight. Like, oh, I have that bar mitzvah coming up or I have that wedding and like I need to fit into that dress and oh, I feel disgusting. Oh, quarantine 15, COVID-19, whatever. And you're bringing up all of these things about weight gain and feeling disgusting in your skin. Your kids are hearing that even if you think they're on the iPad or they're playing on your phone and they're not listening, like you said, selective hearing, they tune in when they want to. So they're hearing that and that impacts them. And then they start, okay, well, my mom doesn't feel good in her body because it's bigger. It must be bad to be in a bigger body or I can't have that. My, my nutritionist said, I can't have cake. I'm not going to eat that. Right? Like, and then they hear, oh, cake is bad because whoever mommy's working with said that she can't have that. Right. Or you know, oh, I'm trying to, you know, I, I am cutting back. I can't, if I have that, I'll eat the whole bag, right? Showing that we don't have control. Food is something to be scared of. So again, when we say these things in front of our kids, they internalize that message and then that forms their relationship with food and their body. So even if you are raising an intuitive eater, you do that division of responsibility and you say, you had enough, great. You don't want to have the carrots, no problem. But you have these conversations with your friends it, it's you're not doing the work it really a parent has to look at how what is my relationship with food and body because that's going to impact their relationship with food and body more so than how i'm training them to you know what what space i'm giving them to listen to their bodies and to be intuitive but if the whole time i'm saying yeah but i'm on a diet well i'm an autonomous adult i can be on a diet but not you you're a child it's you're, you're teaching two separate messages and that's confusing for them. And they're more likely going to want to do what you do than what you tell them to do. Right. And that's very important. That's a parenting, you know, piece of advice, like 
for anything in life. It's not what you tell them to do or not do. It's what you do yourself. So if you tell them to be kind and you are not kind to them and you are not kind to people in your home, it doesn't matter if you lecture from here to tomorrow. They will most likely just copy the behaviors that you you know, model for them. So it's really important if you don't want your child to feel bad about themselves and you don't want them to say, mommy, is it bad if I'm fat? Is it bad if I, you know, if I'm, is it, is it okay to go on a diet? Are chips bad for you? Then you have to make sure that you're making food a very neutral thing, that all food is good. All food has a time and place that we listen to our bodies, that there's a time to enjoy cake and there's a time to have fruits and vegetables, and there's a time for ice cream, and whatever it is, we let there's space for all foods. So it really comes from your attitude first and foremost. And I would say if your child is having a hard time with their body and and food, then I would wanna look at myself first and say like, am I really conveying a consistent message in my behavior and in the way that I treat them? that would be the first thing and then you know again sometimes there is peer influence right as our kids get older and they're teenagers especially with girls this is how they like bond they talk about oh i'm so fat oh i'm on a diet i'm not eating carbs like it's become a bonding thing for girls which is really disturbing but again i think they're modeling a lot what they see their mothers doing or their aunts or their sisters doing um and also it's become a societal thing that girls should be obsessed with how they look and obsessed with what they eat so if you see that your daughter is doing that and it's not something you do, then you want to have that conversation. I get it that your friends talk about this and this is something that they're really into, but that's not something we do. We believe in honoring our hunger and respecting our bodies and we don't diet and there's a time for all foods and we don't restrict, especially if you're growing. We don't we don't cut out whole food groups and say that certain you can't eat a pizza chip because it's carbs. Like we don't do that. You know, so having that conversation and even giving them the tools of how to respond or what to do when their friends are having those conversations, they don't have to participate in them. So I think that's right. important also, you know? That's that's very important. Um, and, and it's also important that you're mentioning how, how girls bond. Boys don't generally bond like that. It's not as overt, but you do still see some of these concerns with boys. And we do have a higher incidence of eating disorders among boys than people really know about. So it's important that even though, you know, I, we're, we're an all boy family over here, aside from me and my little kitty, um, it's still a concern. It's still something to watch out for, uh, for yeah. parents who are concerned. And um, boys don't hide it better also because we don't expect it from boys. Yeah. That's something to be kind of aware of also. Like if your son is obsessed with building muscles or a six pack or, you know, eating only certain foods, don't just kind of like, put, oh, you know, boys, they want to be like, you know, look like a wrestler or an athlete or whatever. That could be a problem too. That could be a sign of this really unhealthy um, relationship with their body and developing disordered eating or an eating disorder. So it's very much a girl and boy, male and female issue. And yeah. we need to be aware of that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, th I think it's very important that we don't make assumptions because assumptions don't get us anywhere healthy. Yeah. Uh, so another thing that I wanted to bring up is that I think this is a very important part of parenting. And I think I bring this up often so that maybe I will start learning this lesson personally. But we don't have to answer every question immediately. Yeah. If your child says something that catches you off guard and you don't know how to answer right away, you can say, this is a really important topic. I really want to hear what you have to say. Can we talk about this a little later? And yeah. you can come back to it. Not everything, you don't You don't have to be encyclopedia of perfect parent to give an appropriate response. Yeah, and I think that, that sometimes parents think like they have to have the answer all the time or their kids won't trust them or their kids won't come to them. But I think that you build trust even more with your child when you tell them, you know what, that's a great question and I don't know the answer. Let me call a friend. Let me, you know, let me read about it. Let me try to find out the answer for you and get back to you. And then getting back to them. And then your child sees like, okay, first of all, it's okay to not know all the answers. And second of all, I can always come to my mom or dad and they'll they'll try to find the answers for me. They are like a safe, responsible source of information. And you want to be your child's primary source of information. You don't want them Googling. You don't want them asking their friends. So I think that saying, I don't know, or I'm not sure is a very powerful thing. 
um, that you don't always have to have the answers. And sometimes if we try to make up the answers, we do more harm. So to say like, you know what, that's great. And I'm not sure about that. Let me call a friend. Let me read about that some more. And, and I'm going to, let's read about it together. Let's try to figure it out. You know, let's start looking some stuff up. I think that that's like a really um, great modeling, you know, tool. And I think it, it builds trust with your child of like, okay, my mom doesn't necessarily have the answer right now, but she wants to find it for me. And like, then I'm going to keep going back to her because I see it's important for her that I have the right information, you know? It's so, that's such a great point that we can, we can kind of model imperfection and we can model how it is to not have all the answers and show our kids that it's okay to say, I don't know, let's find out together. That's, that's, I think that's a really, it's a really valuable skill to have in life. So that's an added bonus. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, so, so another point is that we are really surrounded by a lot of visuals. Whether you are at home or you're out, we're surrounded by visuals that indicate the quote unquote perfect body. And, and there's really no helping that. You can't control everything that's out in the world. And so a good way to balance that is by making sure that you have different types of visuals around your house, making sure that your kids are familiar with people who, who have different color skin or different abilities or different sizes. And, and just by being conscious to include those visuals in your house, it normalizes it and will make that conversation a little bit easier for you when that time comes. Yeah, definitely. And I, and you know what, it's so funny because growing up, I remember thinking there was always some talk about Barbie, right? That Barbie was really feeding into unhealthy body image. And I remember thinking like, that's so silly. Like, no, it's not like, it's so ridiculous. And I, I didn't buy it. You know, I was still also very much in, in a diet culture mentality as I was getting older and hearing that argument. And now I have girls and we have very diverse Barbies in my home. We have, um, we have black Barbies, we have big Barbies, we have a Barbie with, um, you know, with, with braids, we have tall Barbies, short Barbies, we have all kinds of different, you know, we have wheelchair Barbie, we just have all different, you know, Barbies in our home. And I remember that before I got those Barbies, one of my younger daughters was playing and I put, you know, we had just gotten like big Barbie and I put her down next to the thin Barbie and I said, Who, which one do you like better? And she pointed to the thin Barbie and I said, why? And she said, she's prettier. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. Now we're getting more about, <laughs> you know, but I was like, why? Why is she prettier? And she said, because her tummy is smaller. So that's when I was like, oh, my gosh, like, we are not a diet culture home. Like, this is so, but she's influenced by, if she's constantly seeing thin, blonde, tiny, petite Barbie, like, that's what she thinks is pretty. Barbie is pretty. So I want to show her all Barbies are pretty, all bodies are pretty, all hair types, all, you know, so we have Barbie with an Afro, we have Barbie with braids, we have Barbie with short hair, we have Barbie with long hair. So now there's so much more diversity in what she plays with. So we shouldn't really, we shouldn't just, you know, dismiss and be like, it doesn't matter. It's, it's fine. They can play with a white blonde Barbie that's skinny and, and they'll still, you know, understand that standards of beauty are, you know, everybody's beautiful and everyone's, you know, important and every but it does matter what they see. So when they're watching TV shows and they don't see any fat kids in TV shows or they don't see any black kids or they don't see any kids with disabilities, that matters because then when they see someone with a disability, a physical disability or, you know, or or anything, they're kind of like, "What?" and then they stare. What oh my, what is that? I've never seen that before. And then we're like, "Don't stare at it," right? But if we don't expose our kids to these kinds of things, they're not going to understand it and they're not going to value it and say like, okay, I understand everybody's different. If I've only seen a certain kind of look my whole life, then when I see something different, I question it. Is that normal? There's no normal. We're all diverse. Everything is good. Everything is, is you know, we, we want them to see that. So for me personally, I definitely was, my eyes were opened when I saw that and my daughter made that statement. And, you know, and since then we just, we have very diverse dolls in our home and it makes a difference, you know? So what your kids watch, what they play with, what they're reading, right? Or do you have books with black kids in them? Do you have books with, you know, again, kids in wheelchairs or having any kind of physical disabilities? Like, do you expose them to that stuff? It, it matters because we want them to understand not everybody looks the same. And if we want to show them that not everybody looks the same and that's okay, then of course we have to bring that into the home. It's not enough to say it. We also have to show it, you know? and do it. So I think that's really important. And for you yourself, even as an adult, again, starts with you on social media. Who are you following? 
who is in your feed? Are you only seeing one type of body, one type of person, one type of skin color, one type of hair color, one kind of, you know, viewpoint? You need to also diversify what you see so that you can really believe it when you tell your kids all bodies are good and everyone comes in different shapes and sizes and it doesn't matter what you look like is really not important it's who you are what do what gifts and talents do you have how do you contribute to the world in a meaningful way you know that's what matters so it's really it's a combination of of giving them the message but even more so you living that message and being that message you know right so there's the mental aspect of it, which is what we've been talking about, the relationship with body, the relationship with food. Um, and and this is it, it's all very important to get that across because that's what's going to last with them. These these concepts last much longer than any words will. Yeah. And it's important also to to bring it back to the idea that when we have this healthy outlook, when we have respect for our body and we have a healthy relationship with food, that will also lead to the physical health benefits that don't necessarily happen on the scale, but when we're looking at um, at, at blood levels, we're looking at micronutrient levels, we're looking at um, like vitamin D, for example, it's big in the news right now, and B12, when we're looking at um, if you have enough, uh, enough fat on your body to, I don't know, menstruate, for example, you know, to have, to have normal bodily functions. And you're when you have a child who grows up with this philosophy and has that healthy relationship with body and food, they are less likely to have these disease states that we're trying to avoid with all the restrictive dieting. Yeah, They're going to have healthy um, blood pressure because they're not gonna be as stressed about everything. Stress increases blood glucose. So someone who is under a lot of stress is more likely to have um, blood glucose that's out of control and causing health concerns as well. So this is not only about the child's mental health as if that isn't enough it is also about their physical health in the long term and that's what we're playing it's a long game yeah. nutrition nutrition is a marathon it's not a sprint nothing is going to happen at any one given meal or even in one week or right now we're still in lockdown and here in arizona we are we're going back into lockdown not that some of us ever left our houses um right. This is a blip in time, and there are some things going on right now that we, we really just need to consciously avoid trauma, consciously avoid these negative talk conversations, and support our kids in the best way possible. This is a blip in time. We will get past this. We will move back into the normal world, and it's important to re-enter whatever that normal will be from the healthiest perspective possible, both in body and in spirit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So some positive ways to do that. Um, positive feeding dynamic. This has come up a number of times through this talk, but if if you really need to brush up on that, um, look up division of responsibility. I recently posted on my blog a, a rundown of that and how it interacts with intuitive eating and how it interacts with other philosophies you may be familiar with. Um, so you can check that out. Varied visuals, um, as, as Rachel mentioned, who are you looking at and and what is the art in your house and um what, what's the atmosphere you're creating as far as what is in your child's field of vision or hearing yes. um, and then positive self-talk around kids and yes. we, we talked about how you don't want to disparage yourself but maybe you want to talk about something positive like wow I am so strong, I can lift this object, whatever. I, what really hit me when I first got involved in this whole philosophy was the idea that your weight is the least interesting thing about you. Yep. And it's amazing how even if you just look at, at people like, like Adele, for example, she is accomplished. And, and let's say Lizzo, also accomplished women. Yep. Their weight is the least interesting thing. I mean, look how dynamic they are, the beautiful voices, gaining yeah. weight, losing weight. This is not an accomplishment. This is this is something that has nothing to do with their accomplishments in life. And there are so much, there's so much more to talk about with these women, with all women, with all people. Weight is not interesting. We yeah. can talk about something much more interesting. Yeah, definitely. And, and and it's kind of like a morbid thing, but I, I've, I've always, I've heard this saying, like, your weight is not going to be on your headstone, you know? Like, that's not what they're going to write about you when you die in your obituary. Like, wonderful mother, caring sister, loving father, successful, you know, businessman, and weighed X amount of pounds. Like, 
they're not going to say that about you because it literally is so irrelevant. So why right. do we give so much of our time and energy in our lifetime to pursuing a certain weight? You know, it's it's it will not come up when you pass away unless your kids are like my mom was obsessed with being thin her whole life. Like, boy, you know, right? That's it's so not important. So I think that just having that, you know, perspective and that insight and that re reminder of like that is not what going to be what they're going to say about me when I pass away, or I don't want that right. to be say about me when I'm not in this world anymore. I think that's like a good, you know, wake up call of like, why am I wasting my time pursuing this? You know, I would rather that my child remembers that I was fun and I was happy and I loved them and I, you know, played with them and I, you know, and, and I was positive and supportive and all those things, you know, right. That's what your kids and what you want your friends and your families to remember about you. Um, yeah. So I just have a couple reading recommendations that I want to share. Sure. Um, so this book is actually amazing by Rebecca Alexander. Um, there's this whole series, a kid's book about, and so they have a kid's book about racism, a kid's book about like all, all different topics, all sensitive things that you can talk about. Um, and this one is amazing, a kid's book about body image. And she basically talks about how she is someone who lives in a bigger body and people judge her. And then she goes into talking about how we live in a society that will try to tell you that your teeth need to be whiter, your hair needs to be straighter, your body needs to be smaller. And people try to profit off of that, off of making you feel like you need to fix yourself. And the work that we need to do is to say, I don't need to fix myself. I'm fine the way I am. And learning how to respect ourselves and love ourselves in spite of all of the messages that we're going to get that we're not good enough. And I think that's so powerful for kids to hear. And for us to hear, like, I know when I read the book every time I'm like, oh, oh my God, like I needed that reminder, you know, because even while I'm doing the work, I always say it's a constant process. It's not like, okay, I've ditched dieting and, and I'm working on body acceptance and body respect and like, hey, I'm good now. No, I also have days where I feel like, oh, like it's so hard and I don't feel good in my skin. And you know what, like I, maybe dieting is up. Oh, and I have to bring myself back. No, it's not worth it, you know? So this is really a great book to read with your kids and honestly for yourself. And then um, Evelyn Triboli and Elise Rice just came out with their newest edition of the Intuitive Eating with updated research. And um, some of the stuff in their previous book, they said, you know, felt like they were a little bit diet culture-ish and they, they've they learned, which I think is an amazing thing also. They've learned and they've grown in their work and they've made some changes. So this is the newest edition of the book and I highly recommend it for, you know, if you're thinking about pursuing intuitive eating or you wanna do it for your kids, you know, you wanna start implementing it at home. Um, there's so much interesting research in here about mm -hmm. dieting, how it doesn't work, the harms and how intuitive eating is so beneficial for us, not just physically, but mentally, our mental health. And again, mental and physical health, they're not two separate things. They are the same thing. They are very much intertwined and one influences the other very much. So um, instead of seeing them as two separate entities, we have to understand that they're they're pretty much the same thing. They work together. You can't right. have one without the other, you know? There's a lot of research about the gut brain access, access and a lot of people are um, maybe getting sick of microbiome as a buzzword, but the thing is that there's so much interplay. And we, from a physical science perspective, like to think that if you have a healthy gut, it's going to have beneficial outcomes on your mood, which there is some, some research behind that. But the truth is that we don't know cause and effect. There could be interplay in both directions that, yeah. and we actually do know that, that stress causes changes in the microbiome, which yes. will then cause um, cause depression and anxiety and all that. So we do have, it's a two way street. Yes. It's not just take your probiotic and you'll be fine. It's much more complex than that. Of course, yes. it has to be more complex than that. Always. Um, so while we're on the subject of books, I just wanted to, to bring up, there are certain books that are written for children directly to discuss nutrition with them. And this is not something that I recommend. And yes. I have toyed around with the idea of writing my own book, but what it comes back to is kids don't need to learn about nutrition as far as macro and micronutrients. From a scientific perspective, sure. I mean, my kids, being that they're my kids, understand what the different macronutrients are and how it benefits your body. We only talk about it in a positive, but that's not even something that I recommend for conversations in, in a lot of families because that can go sideways very, very quickly. It can go negative very, very quickly. And so it's much better 
to surround your kids with positivity and give them a positive message and enjoy different foods together, whether that is pizza with sauteed spinach on top, my personal favorite, or having an ice cream party together. It's just sitting down together and enjoying food together. That's going to be all of the positive message about food that your kids are going to need. They do not need a book directly for them about food. So the yeah, book that you mentioned was about body image and that's a very different angle and that's an important thing to understand. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, teaching kids about nutrition, like I know there's schools that have nutrition classes. I just think it's really yeah. not helpful because kids are very concrete and they're learning. That's basically reinforcing the idea of like good and bad. Fruits yeah. and vegetables, good. Cakes and cookies, bad. Like that's all they're seeing. It's black and white and, and that's not there again, like there's a time and a place for all foods and all foods serve a purpose and all foods have nutritional value. And we want them to know that. So I yeah. think that teaching kids about nutrition is a waste of time and it's confusing. So you don't want to do that. Yes. You know? That's a hundred percent true. Um, and that being said, um, a friend of mine, also a pediatric dietitian came out with an amazing resource yesterday, 47 pages and it's free on her website but it's using fruits and vegetables as a basis to talk about diversity and inclusion. And it's a coloring book and you can cut out eyes and legs and wheelchairs and crutches and different kinds of hair. And you can talk about how all of these different plants are different in color and taste and texture and all these different, it's, it's fantastic. So um, go on to Experience Delicious now and hit up the freebies. But I can tell you 100% she does not talk anything about body image and good and bad. And even on that note with the school lessons with good and bad, even when they frame it as always, sometimes never, um, they don't usually say never, they usually give it a, a nicer term, but still kids don't understand. It's not developmentally appropriate. And it's also not nutritionally appropriate. So we are we're not in favor of that. Um, so I'm just going to read a, a viewer comment. Um, Terry, who is also a dietitian focused on kids, says, I was just chatting with my with my daughter about fat on bodies last night. Great timing. Okay. And, um, offhand, I think I think your daughter's maybe nine. I don't remember. Um, if you can answer in time, let me know. And she also says thanks for the book recommendations. Okay, yes. That's helpful. I will link to those in the show notes and all that jazz. Okay. So I think we have, have we covered everything you think? I think so. I'm looking at our list. I think we talked about everything that we wanted to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to email me, yaffi, Y-A-F-F-I at babybloomnutrition.com. I'm happy to field these questions and we'll loop in Rachel as needed. Um, thank you so much for joining me, Rachel. Where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram. I'm at Rachel Tuckman LMHC on Instagram. I'm on Facebook a little bit. I, I just share the content from my Instagram on Facebook. Um, and you can also email me. It's Rachel at LILMHC.com. Thank you so much for joining us. This is really great. I know it's very necessary and helpful for a lot of people and your perspective is very valuable. Thank you so much. <laughs> So it's everyone, stay tuned for the next nap time nutrition. I usually tell you when it is, um, but since lockdown, it's all over the place. So just check back and um, head up my new YouTube channel, search for nap time nutrition by Baby Blue Nutrition. All 161 nap time nutrition unique topics have been uploaded and categorized for your easy searchability. And if I haven't covered something, I would love to hear it because I'm always looking for new topics and whatever's important to you. So thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Bye.